Thank you so much for joining us for our Mass Towards Marketing Update for the summer of 2017. Today we have a number of different things to discuss as they relate to recent developments in Mass Towards. For those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Victoria Blute. I'm the community manager here at Lawlytics. And my role here is to keep attorneys on the cutting edge of web technologies and online legal marketing and to help you learn what works on the web. I come from a journalism background, and if you happen to read our blog or you've attended some of our past webinars, you might recognize me. Before we get started, I just want to remind our listeners that this webinar is part of an ongoing Mass Torts marketing series. So if you haven't seen the other webinars in this series yet and you're interested in seeing um, what topics we've covered and to learn more about how to effectively market a Mass Torts practice, you can do so by visiting our website. Just go to www.lawlytics.com slash webinars and you'll be able to find all of the webinars in this particular Mass Torts series. Joining me today is Larry Bodine, and he'll be giving the bulk of the presentation today. But before I turn the mic over to him, I'd like to quickly introduce you to him if you're not already familiar with his work. So for those of you who don't know Larry, he has a very impressive resume, both as an attorney and as a legal marketer. He's currently the senior legal marketing strategist here at Lawlytics, and as well he serves as the editor of the National Trial Lawyers. Larry really has what we see as a second to none expertise in the evolving field of mass torts marketing and specifically in multi-district litigation. And as always, it's great to have him here. So with that, I'm going to give a brief introduction into what we're going to be discussing today. And then I'm going to turn the mic over to him for most of this presentation. And then I'll be coming back in at the end just to cover a few last topics before we close. So first, Larry is going to discuss a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision that limits specific jurisdiction for mass torts in state courts. He'll give you the background on that and what it could mean for you. And then he'll talk about what the best path forward is for mass torts plaintiffs. After that, Larry is going to tell you about several cases that are headed for settlement, and those include the chemotherapy drug Taxotere, IVC filters, as well as the class of antibacterial drugs known as fluoroquinolones. And then we'll move on to a case um, to discuss a case that's worth keeping an eye on, and that's a topic that we have covered in the past, which is the blood thinner Xarelto. And just as a FYI, if you haven't seen our webinar on that topic, that's available over at the Lawlytics website as part of our Mass Towards Marketing series. After that, I am going to hop in and tell you a little bit about how to create content that attracts clients to your mass towards practice and how to use an old tool, the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why, to generate new business online. And lastly, I'll quickly discuss how to craft a content plan for a mass towards practice that will help you stay focused and on the right track. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Larry. Thanks very much, Victoria. I'm really glad to be presenting this here today. I want to get started with a new U.S. Supreme Court decision, which kicked out 592 non-resident plaintiffs out of a California court case. The decision in question was Bristol Myers Squibb versus Superior Court of California, decided last June 19th. It was a product liability case involving Plavix, which is a blood thinner, and the case was in California state courts. And what the court decided was, uh, the Supreme Court, was that there is no specific jurisdiction in state courts over a corporation that is not incorporated or headquartered in the state. The U.S. Supreme Court decided that to find specific jurisdiction, there must be a, an, a quote, affiliation between the forum and the underlying controversy principally an activity or an occurrence that takes place in the forum state. So the uh, point is that it was not good enough that the in-state, uh, rather that the out-of-state plaintiffs, the non-resident plaintiffs, had the identical claim as in-state plaintiffs. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that the focus in these cases needs to be on the activities of the defendant. In this case, it was Bristol-Myers Squibb, 
and the court said that the lawsuit needs to arise out of or relate to the defendant's conduct in the forum. It's not good enough if the corporate defendant has an R&D facility in the state, 250 sales reps, or sells 187 million Plavix, pill, Plavix pills every year in the state. On the other hand, the court found uh, that the uh, company did not manufacture the drug, label it, package it, or work on regulatory approvals in the state, and therefore found that there was no specific jurisdiction. Now, there's already been fallout from this decision. Um, some cases, uh, some plaintiffs were dismissed in Missouri federal court, uh, eight out of 96 plaintiffs, and that was a case uh, involving the blood thinner Pradaxa. And uh, in another Missouri federal court case, 86 out of 94 plaintiffs were dismissed in cases over the birth control device Assure. Now, I want to note that these federal court cases were the uh, uh, in Bristol Myers Squibb and in Pradaxa and Insure are not cases in multi-district litigation dockets. And I'll explain why that's important in a second. So the best path forward for mass tort plaintiffs, I think, in light of this decision, are that if you're in a state court, file suit where the plaintiff ingested the bad drug. File suit where the corporate defendant is headquartered or incorporated and where the corporate conduct gave rise to the claim. Now, unfortunately, this may put you in a state court that is not plaintiff friendly. And so what I would recommend is that if you're a plaintiff representing a, uh, a claimant who's got a product liability case involving a drug, uh, avoid the state courts entirely and file in a federal MDL. That's a multi-district -lit litigation docket. There are a lot of them. There are 233 MDLs with more than 125,000 cases pending. So there's a lot of activities in these MDLs. Now, a good thing is that an attorney can represent a client located anywhere in the U.S. It doesn't matter if they're in-state or out-of-state. Uh, the courts post fill-in-the-blanks short-form complaints and plaintiff fact sheets for you to use. If you're a plaintiff attorney, you just need to enter an appearance and let the plaintiff steering committee, uh, let them do all the work. And then finally, what it really boils down to is you should devote all your efforts to getting clients in these cases because the rest of it is, is really pretty straightforward, as I've described. Now, there are, I, I get asked all the time, you know, uh, what, what cases are heading, heading for settlement? What cases are being settled right now? So I've, I've identified three of them for you. The first one is Taxotere, second one is IVC filter, and the third one is fluoroquinolones, or FLQs for short. So starting with Taxotere, there are uh, about 1,300 cases filed before Chief U.S. District Judge Kurt Engelheim in the Eastern District of Louisiana. This is MDL 2740, and this involves disfiguring permanent hair loss. The lawsuits involve this chemotherapy drug, Taxotere, and the claimants allege that the manufacturer, Sanofi Aventis, failed to warn the, the patients or their doctors about increased risks for permanent alopecia, which is permanent loss of hair. And there are a lot of plaintiffs uh, to be found in, in, this, in these cases. It's estimated that 3 million women right now have breast cancer and 75 of them were prescribed Taxotere. That works out to about 2.25 million women who took this drug. Uh, typically, the plaintiffs uh, need to have experienced hair loss for six months or longer, and they must have been treated with Taxotere between 2006 and 2016. The court has decided the claims for generic as well as brand name claims can be filed in the MDL, and the reason I'm talking about this is the judge has ordered the attorneys to engage in continuous general settlement discussions on a regular basis and told them he wants them to focus on settlement as opposed to taking detailed discovery and doing a lot of trial preparation. So that's a case uh, to take a look at. The second one involves a device, a medical device called an IVC filter. There are more than 2,300 cases filed before U.S. District Judge uh, Richard Young in the Southern District of Indiana. 
This is MDL 2570, and it involves a specific manufacturer, Cook Medical Incorporated. So IVC filters are these small cage-like devices that are inserted into a patient's body, and the idea is for them to capture blood clots and prevent them from reaching the lungs. Evidence shows, however, that these filters can cause serious injury once implanted, and the lawsuits that are now underway to compensate victims uh, have had the uh, the following uh, uh, complications. The, uh, the filters fragment, the, the little pieces break apart and perforate the vessel wall. They migrate to other parts of the body. They cause uh, pulmonary embolisms, which are blood clots in the lung, and they cause death. Now, the, the judge is pressuring the parties to settle these Cook Medical Device cases. He's ordered both sides to appear at three hearings. Uh, the first one was, uh, was back in uh, July, and that was for plaintiffs only. The second one was uh, today, and that was for uh, August 4th for defense attorneys only. And there's another one coming up on August 29th. It's a follow-up conference for plaintiff counsel only. And this is all in advance of bellwether trials that are coming up in October 2nd this year involving Cook Medical's Select Filter and their Gunther Tulip Filter. And the third tort, where there's a lot of settlement taking place, involves FLQs, fluoroquinolones. To date, there are 752 cases before U.S. District Judge John R. Tunheim in Minnesota, and this is in MDL 2642. And the, the brand names of the drugs in question are Levaquin, Cipro, and Avalox, antibacterial drugs. They cause um, permanent nerve damage, uh, uh, something that's called peripheral neuropathy, which involves burning pain, numbness, tingling, sensitivity to touch, and muscle weakness. So you, you get prescribed this antibacterial drug, and those are the side effects that the claimants are talking about. So everything changed after the judge held what he called a science day. And this is where basically the, the parties present PowerPoint presentations from their scientists. And after that, the, the judge basically decided we're going to take, we, he's pressuring the, the parties to settle these cases. And one of the key uh, elements in this is a, an evidentiary fact, and that is that both defendants, Johnson & Johnson and Bayer, have publicly acknowledged that FLQs can cause neuropathy. And this happened at the FDA's Joint Advisory Committee meeting in November 2015, where Dr. Susan Nicholson, who is a Vice President of Safety uh, and Surveillance for Johnson & Johnson, uh, testified for all the defendants. And she agreed that FLQs cause neuropathy as well as uh, severe tendon ruptures. And it's worth noting that many cases have already settled, however, for undisclosed amounts. And the case to watch is going to be Zeralto. The trial gets underway next week on August 7th. It's going to be the third bellwether trial that will be tried in the Southern District of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi. So the claim in this case, uh, let me back up a little bit. As you can see from the chart, there, uh, has been, uh, there have been more than 17,000 cases filed, and more and more cases are being filed all the time. There before U.S. District Judge Eldon Fallon in the Eastern District of Louisiana, and the MDL number is 2592. Now the claim in these is that the blood thinner causes uncontrollable internal bleeding, uh, and there is no antidote to it. If you have internal bleeding caused by Xarelto, the only uh, treatment for it is to transfuse all of the blood out of your body and replace it. And the claim is that Bayer and Johnson Johnson failed to provide physicians and the public with adequate warnings about this. Now, the, what's happened up to now is very interesting in that there have already been two bellwether trials. Both of them ended up with uh, verdicts for the defense. And, uh, you know, I would add, having covered these cases, that these were both incredibly weak cases. I'm really surprised the, uh, the plaintiffs took them to trial. For example, the second one involved a 67-year-old woman, and she had high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, stage 3 kidney disease, heart failure, 
and gout. Oh, and she was also taking Xarelto for atrial fibrillation. So you can see how the jury might think, gee, there's a lot of other things that could have caused her problems. And to top it all off, the death certificate said she died from hypertension, not from an internal bleeding. So, you know, it, uh, it remains to be seen how the next trial will go. As I mentioned, it's going to start next week. It involves a plaintiff who got deep vein thrombosis after she had a hip replacement. Now, uh, there seems to be a little bit uh, a better connection to Zorelto in this one. Uh, after the hip replacement, she was prescribed Zorelto on January, January 23rd, 2015. 21 days later, on February 13, she was ordered to go to the emergency room and she had the transfusion I just described because she had all of this internal bleeding. Now, what's going to happen in this case? Uh, you know, the prevailing view is that uh, there won't be a settlement until something happens in the litigation that affects the stock price of Bayer and Johnson & Johnson because Zarelto is a blockbuster drug for these companies. Uh, in 2014, the sales for Zarelto were $3.7 billion, and all of the quarterly reports I read is that Zarelto is making a lot of money for the company. So uh, all eyes are on this litigation, and you know the one thing that the plaintiffs have in the back of their mind is that there was a very similar drug called Perdaxa, a blood thinning drug, and in 2014, those cases uh, settled with a $650 billion settlement. So what will happen? Will there be a multi-billion dollar settlement? Well, you know, we need to have some verdicts in favor of the plaintiff first. And that's where things stand with Zeralto. Thanks, Larry. So I mentioned earlier that this particular webinar is available as part of our Mass Towards Marketing series. I just want to briefly go over it before we move on to matters of content. So this particular webinar, um, specifically about Xarelto, it will give you a detailed overview of the history of Xarelto, its approval process, as well as how to attract potential clients for Xarelto cases. And at this point, it's still pretty easy to get involved in Zarelto litigation. Um, as Larry mentioned earlier, the court has established both short and long form complaints. So essentially, all you need to do is find the client and then fill in the blanks as appropriate. Um, and the defense has put together a plaintiff fact sheet that goes through the questions about the medical history of the patient, um, also available from the court, and that's a fill in the blanks sheet. So this, of course, is quite different from typical personal injury cases where the facts and the defendants change all the time. Here, instead, you've got a fixed set of facts and set defendants. So really, the primary effort that needs to be put in is acquiring new clients. And when it comes to acquiring new clients for a mass towards practice, a very important element in that is content. So let's talk about that a little bit. Content is a major component of successful mass towards marketing, and content is really what we excel at doing for attorneys or helping attorneys do that themselves. And this is really a wide open field right now. So the attorneys who get there first, who get there with the most content and the best content, are those who are likely going to see the biggest benefit. As I have said before, the internet is the great equalizer, and it's made online marketing a meritocracy. So it's no longer the firms with the biggest budgets that are the only ones who can compete. And the cost of entry to compete, both on a local level and a national level, is probably not as high as you would believe just based on what other marketing sources are likely to tell you. So if you are going to write your own content for a mass towards practice, it's important to think about what goes into that before you get started. And one efficient way to do that is sort of the old journalism technique of the five W's. So who, what, where, when, why, and yes, sometimes how. Uh, but let's look first at content as it relates to these questions, because they can help you create content that is extremely relevant to your potential clients in a mass towards practice that really answers the questions that they have and that makes it much more likely that they're going to reach out to your firm. So the first bullet point here is for who. Who are your potential clients? Who are your referral sources? And this is really an important one to think about before you get started writing content because it's going to make a difference in how you approach your audience. And be very specific here. It's not necessarily enough to say, 
well, my potential clients are those who have had defective hernia mesh implanted, or my potential clients are those who have been injured by Xarelto. Really drill down into the specifics. So if we use hernia mesh as an example, maybe it's potential clients who have had hernia mesh implanted um, and they are experiencing X symptom or Y symptom. Maybe they've had a bowel perforation or an infection that could be traced back to that device. And you could have a potential client in a number of situations. Maybe they realize that their hernia mesh is possibly responsible, but they're really not sure what they can do about it. They may be in a situation where they've suffered and they have not put two and two together. Um, they might not realize that the hernia mesh is responsible for that particular injury. So develop a client persona because that's going to help you write highly detailed, specific content that attracts not just anyone, but really quality, viable potential clients. And that brings me to my next bullet point here. So what questions are your potential clients and referral sources asking? And the reason for creating educational resources online is that there are likely many potential clients in your total addressable market who may not even realize that they need to seek your services in the first place. So they may be doing online research about chronic pain that they're having, um, again, to use the example after hernia mesh surgery or about an infection they have. And if you are writing about these kinds of topics in depth and you're creating this very high quality content, Google is likely to return your website and your web pages in results for relevant queries that these people are making. Google is very interested in quality content and quality content is educational, it's useful, and it's adding something new to the online conversation. And that comes down to how many people are out there who don't know or who don't realize um, that any of these topics you know, are at the root of their particular problem. The way that these individuals are likely to go about discovering that is using search engines to conduct searches about um, symptoms they're having, side effects, things like that. So if they're doing this research and they might have been having something that's a cause of action, or they're looking up information for a family member, if they're typing these kinds of questions into search engines, they may not know exactly how to formulate these questions, which is why we often stress that you take into consideration how your potential speak as you're writing. But if they're doing that, there's a lot of ways to connect with potential clients. But that's where a lot of legal marketing falls short. So sometimes there's an assumption that a potential client always knows that um, one of these problems is um, related to a drug or a device, and that's not always the case. So there are a lot of ways to connect, but that education is necessary. And the best way to do that is with a website, not with buying leads or pay-per-click marketing or anything like that. So keep in mind, as I said, many of these potential clients may not even realize that they need an attorney yet. So trying to rank for um, very, very basic keyword searches um, like Xarelto attorney or hernia mesh attorney or trying to buy pay-per-click for those basic keywords, those things aren't going to make a lot of sense when you consider that that's not how most potential clients are searching. And furthermore, to that point, those kinds of tactics aren't a good use of your time or your marketing budget. So the best way to reach these potential clients is by providing a lot of useful, relevant information on your law firm's website that covers points like, um, you know, the symptoms and the side effects of a particular drug or device, um, types of injuries caused by the drug or device, FDA warnings, new medical research, um, medical options that may be available to treat adverse events that have been caused by a drug or device. So the next thing to answer is, when do your potential clients want the answers? This is something that we've talked about a little bit in previous webinars. We've often talked about the difference between, say, a short range and a long range kind of answer, because that can help you write in a way that makes sense for your particular target group. So examples that we've given in the past include, um, you know, if the answer is needed immediately, um, and yes, I realize this isn't a perfectly relevant example here, um, but if a DUI attorney has potential clients who were arrested last night, they're going to be arraigned tomorrow, those people need some answers pretty quickly about what to do next, but someone like a tax planning attorney or an estate planning attorney, they might have someone coming back to their website a number of times to learn more about wills or trusts or things like that. Now, in the case of a mass torts practice, the answers that your potential clients need may be slightly more on the side of immediate. They've been 
injured, they may be suffering, um, they may not be sure what caused that injury, maybe they're doing research for a family member, maybe they have the notion that it's got something to do with a device or a drug. So you really want to provide them with all of the relevant information that can help them understand more about their issue and inspire them to reach out to you. They need the information and they also need to know that you care. The other thing to answer is where are they at geographically speaking? And with mass torts attorneys, this is really interesting because in some cases, as a practical matter, um, to get business, you want to pick up the local cases. But it's also quite possible, of course, that this may have a national scope as well. So it's important to take the geographic location of your potential clients into consideration as you write your content. And lastly, why should they choose you? What is it about your particular skill set, your personality, your ability to help them that should persuade them to choose your particular practice over any other? Being a good attorney is one thing, but your potential clients may be scared, hurt, frustrated. They care about knowing that you care about their problem. So good, high quality content that educates, that answers their questions is a big part of that. Let's talk just briefly about content planning. So we've gone over a little bit about um, general content for mass torts practices themselves, but content planning is also important. And when I talk about a content plan, I don't mean that you say to yourself, well, I plan to write three blogs this week, a plan. And this is true of just about whatever practice area you're in. Really should be a written document on a Google Doc, a word processor, wherever you want to keep it. But think of it like a business plan. And there are a number of reasons to do it this way. Whether you are a solo practitioner, you're the one calling all the shots, or you're an attorney in a firm with several attorneys, and you're the one in command of your firm's marketing, it really still makes sense to put this in writing because when you do that, what it gives you is the ability to maintain the focus of what is going to be done. When you write it down, you basically have a guidebook. You've got milestones, you have accountabilities throughout the process of creating this plan. And a content plan, when it's done the right way, should not be something that's executed in a week or a month or even half a year. It's something that over the course of 12 to 36 months, looking well ahead into the future, can really help you do content the right way and boost your revenue as a result. So having this document, having an official document, that prevents things like mission creep. It prevents you from losing focus when some marketer cold calls your office. It prevents you from having blank page syndrome when you sit to write something at the computer and you just have writer's block. But having that content plan will really help to keep you on track. The content plan should look out one to three years, just depending upon how fast you think you can get that content created, um, what sort of resources you have available to you. And what it should do is articulate how the content is going to be presented. There should be at least a rough schedule of when the content is going to be produced and published. It should assign who is accountable for each piece of content. And yes, that includes even if you are the only one creating it, because you have to stick to that schedule. It's the concept of, as I've mentioned before, planning the work and working the plan. Because if you're not holding yourself accountable in a very official sort of way, it is very, very easy to put things off and put things off until you're just completely off track. Now, if you have multiple people doing it, for example, maybe you make the plan, then you have a law clerk um, writing the content, or you can even outsource it to a company like Lawlytics to write the content, or you're having somebody else in your firm do it and then maybe it comes back to you for things like editorial revisions. Make sure that plan articulates who's going to do what when they're going to do it. So, as I said before, content is really a major part of successful mass towards marketing. And content is really what we excel at doing for attorneys or helping attorneys do themselves. So I want to talk a little bit about how Lawlytics can help you market your mass towards practice. So not only do we have a platform that makes adding and editing your website, um, adding to rather, I should say, really just a breeze. It's as easy as using any kind of word processor. Um, we also have a content department here at Lawlytics that evolved out of a very specific kind of need. We had attorneys who at the time were writing their own content and as a result of writing that content and publishing content on a regular basis, 
they ended up having so much success that they needed help to keep publishing. So today we're writing millions of words for attorneys um, for their, their law firm's websites and blogs. So I want to talk briefly about our content creation services just for those who might be interested. We have an in-house content creation department which is managed by lawyers. So many of our writers are lawyers. All of them have strong writing and legal backgrounds. And all of the content that gets published on behalf of our customers who choose us to write for them goes through a very rigorous editorial process where lawyers look at all of that before it ever gets published. And we have several levels of content creation that we provide. So these are services ranging from startup content. So let's say you have a brand new site, really doesn't have any content to get it off the ground. Um, we can help you create things like attorney bios, practice area pages, detailed law pages, and so on and so forth, all the way up to these really extensive build outs of over a million words um, for attorneys who want to, over the course of a year or more, build a dominating website for a certain practice area or practices and for certain geographic areas. And yes, that includes Masterworks content. But between those two extremes, we also have a la carte content. So maybe you are writing your own content, you have something big that's coming up that's occupying your time, and you don't want to have a lag in your content. At that point, we can jump in, we can pick up where you left off, and sustain it until you can jump back in and start working again. And we also have the ability to do ongoing, recurring monthly blogging and content creation for our clients. At Lawlytics, we feel it's very important to have more than just a vendor-customer relationship with our members. We take a lot of time at the outset to get to know you and to create a partnership that allows you to participate as little or as much as you want in the creation of your law firm website content. We want to know how you like your content written as far as voice goes. We want to know your objectives. We want to get to know your practice area and your personality. So what we do is we really look at what you are trying to accomplish, what you have already accomplished, and then we make a plan to get there. And that includes if you're ready to jump into something like marketing a mass towards practice. There is so much opportunity here for attorneys and we can really help you meet those goals. So as we finish this presentation, I wanna thank Larry so much for joining us today and providing us with his expertise. And I'd like to remind you that we have lots of free resources available to you over at the Lawlytics website, both in webinar form, in podcasts, as well as blog posts. And those are free for you to access if you want to learn more about how to succeed online without wasting time and without wasting money. And as well, how your potential clients are using the internet to find you. If you have questions about your legal marketing, or you feel like you're ready to take your marketing to the next level, or you're ready to start thinking about mass torts and marketing a mass torts practice, we are here and we're happy to talk with you. So feel free to contact us through any of the methods that you see here. Lawlytics members, you can always submit a support ticket or reach us at support at lawlytics.com. Non-members, you can submit a consultation request from our main website at www.lawlytics.com. You can call us at 800-713-0161 or shoot us an email at info at lawlytics.com. And with that, I'm going to end the recording of this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us.